We've now thought about a special kind of bond, a bond that's default risk-free and inflation protected. And we focused on bonds that are zero coupon bonds with a maturity of n years and a face value that we can denote by FV. We then saw that the law of one price implies that the price of that bond will be equal to the face value of the bond divided by one plus the interest rate to the nth power. Now the interest rate that we use in that calculation is itself a special interest rate. It's the interest rate we would expect to get in a savings account that was similarly inflation protected and risk free. We call that interest rate the real interest rate. And we'll denote it with a subscript R to indicate we mean the real interest rate. So if we now have a risk free inflation protected zero coupon bond with a face value of $1,000 and a maturity of two years, the formula tells us that the price of that bond is going to be equal to the $1,000 face value divided by one plus the real interest rate squared. Once we have that formula, we can derive a table that tells us the relationship between the real interest rate and the prices for such bonds. If the real interest rate is 0%, then we would plug a 0 in for R. That would give us a 1 in the denominator. 1,000 divided by 1 is just 1,000, so the price of that bond will be equal to $1,000. If the interest rate is 1%, we'd plug in 0 0.01 for R. When we do that calculation, we'll get the price of the bond to be $980.30. And as we do that same calculation for different real interest rates, we see that the price of these bonds is going to fall. And that's always going to be true. The prices of bonds are inversely related to the interest rate. We can see that by just looking at the formula. The interest rate appears in the denominator. So as that interest rate goes up, the price of the bond is going to fall. Now it turns out that we don't actually typically see inflation-protected savings accounts in the real world. So we can't actually look at the interest rates that those kinds of accounts offer to determine what the real interest rate in the economy is. But we do have risk-free inflation-protected bonds in the economy, and we can observe those prices. So by observing those prices, we can infer what the real interest rate is. If we observe a price of $961.17, we can infer that the real interest rate in the economy is 2%. Or if we don't have the table, we can simply use the formula. If we observe a price of $961.17, we know that that price is equal to the face value of the bond divided by 1 plus the real interest rate squared. So we can now solve for that real interest rate, multiply both sides through by 1 plus r squared, we'll get 1 plus r squared to this side, and then divide both sides by $961.17 and we'll get 1,000 divided by $961.17 on this side. When we do that calculation, that comes out to be 1.0404. So 1 plus r squared is equal to this. We can now take the square root of both sides. When we take the square root of that, we get 1.02. So 1 plus r is equal to 1.02. Subtract 1 from both sides, and we get the real interest rate that's implied by that bond price to be equal to 0 0.02, the 2% 2 that the table showed us. So by observing these kinds of bonds, we can infer what the real interest rate in the economy is. But the government doesn't just offer inflation-protected bonds. The government also offers non-inflation-protected bonds. Bonds that are still risk-free because the U.S. government is offering them, but they are no longer inflation-protected. So when we calculate the prices of those bonds, we would use exactly the same formulas except the interest rate we would use would not be the real interest rate. Instead, we'd want to use the interest rate that you would get in a savings account that's risk-free 
but not inflation protected. We call that interest rate the nominal interest rate. So we're going to denote that with an N for the nominal interest rate. Now what's the relationship between the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate? And once again we can look at the law of one price. Suppose that you have two savings accounts. One that's inflation protected and one that's not inflation protected. The non-inflation protected savings account would give you a nominal interest rate. And in order for you to be indifferent between investing in the inflation protected savings account and the non-inflation protected savings account, that nominal interest rate is going to have to compensate you for the inflation that's going to happen. So it's going to have to be equal to the real interest rate that you get on the inflation protected account, plus it's going to have to compensate you for the expected inflation. So the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus the expected rate of inflation. That simply comes from the law of one price. In equilibrium, we should be indifferent between investing in the inflation protected savings account and the non-inflation protected savings account. But to make us indifferent, the interest rate on the non-inflation protecting sa savings account has to compensate for that expected inflation. So now, we can actually use the different kinds of bond prices we observe in the real world to infer what markets think the expected rate of inflation is. So suppose that we observe prices for bo government bonds that are not inflation protected. And suppose that we observe a price of $907.03 for such a bond that's zero coupon has a face value of $1,000 and a maturity of two years. If that non-inflation protected bond has a price of $907.03, we can infer that the nominal interest rate is 5%. So we would get a nominal interest rate of 5% in that case. Suppose that we also observe an inflation protected bond of the same kind, selling for $961.17. We can infer from that that the real rate of interest in the economy is 2%. Well, now the equation tells us what the market is expecting the inflation rate to be. The market is expecting the inflation rate to be 3% because that's what balances this equation. That equation is sometimes called the Fisher equation, and it simply relates the nominal interest rate to the real interest rate with the expected rate of inflation. Now, these are not the only two interest rates in the economy. These are two interest rates that are relevant for risk-free investments. Risk-free investments that in one case are inflation protected and in the other case they aren't. But of course, there are lots of risky investments. There are corporations that issue bonds that might have some default risk. And so those bonds are gonna sell at lower prices implying a higher interest rate because in addition to being uh, uh, compensated for the expected inflation rate we'd have to be compensated for the default risk so it would add another term and because different players in the market have different levels of default risk we get lots of different interest rates depending on what that third term that default risk is